Hello, everybody. This is Richard Carafel from Agility. Welcome to PR Profiles, a podcast and video series where we chat with experts in the PR and communications industry. Uh, we think PR is the most formidable, dynamic, and rewarding field there is. And we wanted to introduce you to some of our favorite powerhouses in the industry. And today we're speaking with Oliver Schmidt, the president and CEO of C4CS. Now, you may remember Oliver from our 2022 Crisis Comms Mastery Virtual Summit. He has over 25 years of experience in consulting, training, and executive coaching in crisis management, strategic communication, and organizational leadership. Oliver has worked with clients in more than 40 countries, helping them navigate all phases of a crisis. And not only that, Oliver has also written numerous peer-reviewed articles on crisis management and is a guest professor at leading universities. Hi, Oliver, and welcome to PR Profiles. Hi, Richard. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. You bet. All right, let's dive right into these questions. Um, can't you explain the three phases of crisis management, uh, pre-crisis, response, and post-crisis in a little bit more detail? Uh, and if there were a key strategy for each step that each organization should implement, what would it be and why? Sure, I'll be delighted to do that, Richard. Uh, in the crisis management world, uh, of which crisis communication is a, a part and one that is very important, we distinguish between, as you just said, the pre-crisis phase, the actual crisis phase or response phase, and the post-crisis phase. And they are uh, important to keep in mind because with each come specific to-dos, if you will. The pre-crisis phase is all about anticipation, prevention, and preparedness. So we want to anticipate as best as possible what could potentially happen. Uh, we have certain tools in crisis management. We conduct scenario-based training, and we write plans based on scenarios. So we want to do the scenario development. We want to find out what the risks are, what threats are. There is something called a vulnerability assessment. Those, those are tools at our disposal. And that certainly also spills over into the to-do list that has to uh, that's tackling crisis communication very specifically. The goal at the end of this this pre-crisis phase is always to increase crisis readiness, right? So we want to make sure that whatever we do is leading us to optimizing our readiness for a very broad range of crises. Obviously, we will have in mind those that are the most likely to occur and at the same time that would be the most severe in terms of the impact. The response phase is the second phase or actual crisis phase. That's when we always need to conduct a, a very careful situational assessment. We wanna understand completely what has transpired, why has it transpired, is it still ongoing and so forth. So we have a set of questions there that um, I present to, to clients and we work with clients along that set of questions. And then secondly, it's certainly about executing any plans that we have in place, right? We've hopefully done a ton of training leading up to facing a crisis. And that's when we will utilize the skills that we have acquired as, as part of the training, where we have trained along the lines of plans that have been in place hopefully for a long time. And coming out of the crisis has to do with, in terms of the tasks that need to be performed during the post-crisis phase, the third of the uh, three phases that you also mentioned, that's about recovery. We want to, as an organization, recover from what has happened, whatever incident it might have been, could have been a smoldering crisis, a sudden crisis, lots of different scenarios are certainly possible. And as part of that, we want to go through a very thorough process of evaluation. We evaluate during a crisis in order to adjust strategies and tactics, but we certainly want to evaluate post-crisis, which means we look at what has actually happened during the crisis. Where did we make mistakes? How can we make sure that we won't make the same mistakes again? Right? And this is again about optimizing our future response, if you will. And uh, tied into that is the, the third item that I mentioned under post-crisis phase, the learning. So we need to have organizational learning as well as individual learning coming out of that. And it's, it's because this is a cyclical thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a process that leads us back to the pre-crisis phase. We then obviously need to be sure that we go back to anticipation, prevention, preparedness, and, and follow that, that cycle, if you will.
now. That's very, very important. You also asked, good question, if there are key strategies for each step. I would want to highlight again for the first step that having that crisis communication plan, having designated people, having a crisis communication team in place, those are, those are key um, steps that need to be developed and taken. And then the uh, scenario-based crisis communication training. So if you have plans in place, if you have trained properly, then you have taken big steps toward that, that uh, increased readiness, if you will. Now, in terms of the response phase, what is most important there? It's about executing the plans, as I already mentioned. It's about utilizing the skills that were acquired. I, I would always encourage people to keep in mind that it's about truthful, timely, empathic, coordinated, and coherent communication. And as it uh, relates to the response phase, uh, we at C4CS use crisis communication laws, which we have on our website at c4cs.com. I would encourage people to, if they're interested, look those up. And then the third uh, phase, the post-crisis phase, again, is about learning and it's about reputation management. Something has happened that most likely resulted in our side, our organization taking a hit as far as reputation is concerned. In addition, obviously, there's the bottom line that we have to keep in mind. There are things that from an economic perspective are, are important, but, but looking at crisis communication, it's really about reputation management. It's about rebuilding stakeholder trust and optimizing readiness when it comes specifically to the crisis communication component. No, all right. Okay, <laughs> thanks Oliver, that's fantastic. You really explained that well. Hope everybody takes a good note of that because those steps are all important. Uh, wonderful, now you often speak on both internal and external communication strategies. Now, how large of an impact do you think a company's internal organization and communication strategies have on their ability to handle an external crisis? Huge. First of all, let me say that uh, in, in this day and age, I often no longer distinguish between purely external, purely internal. Uh, these, these areas definitely overlap uh, or during the course of a crisis, you will see that things are spilling over from internal into external and obviously anything external will uh, necessarily impact internal, right? So if I have something happening that uh, does not immediately concern employees, it certainly will down the road. Uh, definitely at the point where a company has to think about things such as downsizing or uh, there is a significant uh, downtick in terms of sales. I mean, you name it. It's, it's definitely going to impact both internal and external. That said, whenever I speak, whenever I present, I make it very clear that it is critically important to understand the, the, the fact that internal communication is really key to managing any crisis effectively. If I don't have my ducks on the wall as far as the internal end is concerned, I will not come out of this ahead. Never possible. It isn't. You know? And there are certain things that go into that. Uh, we, I, I actually, uh, over the last couple of years, have worked with clients that followed our recommendation and built internal crisis communication plans, very specifically for the internal end. They might have been uh, then wrapped into the overall crisis communication plan, but understanding precisely what needs to happen on the internal end is really key. You know? And uh, I, I would therefore encourage everyone to uh, not only have the plan spell that out, but also uh, have that as a component of any training. Any training needs to, in addition to external, in addition to social media component and so forth, also identify critical steps that must be taken, including messaging, including having internal spokespeople um, to, to have employees as trusted allies in this. If you lose the support of your employees during a crisis, it is incredibly damaging. Uh, not only will you obviously have problems in terms of uh, uh, possibly employees leaving the company. This might spill over into uh, possible problems with recruitment of new qualified employees. It's a whole enchilada of, of issues. And to, to stop the domino there from falling, you need to really prepare for that upfront. Right. Yeah, that's good advice. And uh, that internal component is so important now in the social media age where, where one uh, errant uh, social post can either uh, make a crisis much worse or just even create one from Absolutely. the outside. 
Absolutely. And I've seen that. I've seen that very, very often. Last 10 years, roughly a uh, huge, huge increase. Uh, very, very significant in, in terms of the numbers for sure. Right, right, right. Okay. Now, now, more than a decade ago, you mentioned the need for monitoring services across media platforms was increasing and would continue to grow. Uh, so how have things changed since then? Do you see that expected growth? And how do you think things might change again over the next 10 years? Yeah, so first of all, uh, it, it was uh, a little more than 10 years ago, I, I gave an interview, interesting, not, interestingly, not uh, to a uh, communications magazine or communications related outlet, but this was for the disaster resource guide. Again, I do a lot of crisis management work that in terms of business continuity planning, disaster recovery has has to do with crisis communication, but it's, it's really a different arena almost. But it's it's incredibly important to have skills and knowledge as far as these these two disciplines are concerned, right? So crisis management and crisis communication, and this was an interview regarding social media in particular and the necessity of monitoring. First, to your questions, um, Richard, uh, need for monitoring sharply increased. Will continue to grow, no doubt about it. Ten years ago, we actually had companies, larger companies, that had. I would almost say neglected their social media presence. Huge mistake, because if you get hit by a crisis and there is the social media chatter out there, accusations, rumors, whatnot, and you don't even have your own platform in order to uh, work against the tide, then how, how are you going to, to prevail? It's, it's very, very difficult. That has changed more and more. Companies have understood that building their own base of followers, fans, depending on the social media tool, different terminology, obviously, that's really critical. But one thing is for sure, if you today as a company, no matter the size, no matter where you're based, geographic footprint, all that, no matter the industry, if you do not have automated internet and media monitoring in place 24-7, 365 that keeps you abreast of what is happening, not only regarding an actual crisis, but something that could lead to a crisis in the future, right? We talked about pre-crisis phase and anticipation, prevention that, that is tied into that element then you, you may very well be doomed. I, I cannot stress it enough. I mean, I know guys, you guys do that and kudos to you. You do an excellent job as far as I can tell. No company should not have monitoring in place, period. And we do that for a, a bunch of clients, um, but it's not just about the monitoring and spilling out uh, reports that just tell them, okay, this is what we found. It's also about analyzing the content. It's about understanding what's happening and then making recommendations to a client who then can, based upon the recommendations, make critical strategic decisions as far as the core business is concerned, which goes, again, way beyond just communications, right? And again, I don't want to diss communications here. That's my bread and butter. Uh, but but there's, there's also that, that larger uh, component, right? So we, we do need to know, do we need to uh, stop marketing at this point because we're going to hurt ourselves if we continue to market a product that has just been found to be cancer causing or uh, in, in, in whatever other way, um, not according to what the regulators uh, would like to see or whatever the, the particular scenario may be. Yeah. yeah, and I, so I do expect growth. That was your your second question over the last uh, the next ten years. Uh, by all means, it's it's going to grow, and we had better be ready, right? We we want to fine tune monitoring, get better at it, and see to it that it takes a larger role in terms of informing senior management team. And I speak to boards of directors, senior management team, CEOs. I always make it very clear: this is something that you need to be on top of. You need to have reports coming in on a daily basis, ideally, if there is something going, you need to know about it. And the crisis communications team, which is part of the crisis management team, must know what's going on in order to then develop the, the appropriate response or fine tune the, the appropriate response, depending on where you are within the, within the uh, chronological process. Right, yes. Uh, isn't it interesting how um, you know, the, the pre-crisis stage is so important for monitoring. It might be the most important part of it because uh, crisis management is so much about timing, uh, especially now in the social media age and so forth. You've really got to get out in front of these things before they blow up. Um, so, um, so Absolutely. 
Yeah, Ab absolutely. And they will blow up. If, if you don't, if you don't do what you need to do during that pre crisis phase, there's a discipline called issues management, right? We do a lot of work in that arena, where you have, again, it's about vulnerability assessments, risk assessments, threat assessments. If you're good in that department, you can prevent crises from happening, you can anticipate problems, you can prevent them from happening, you don't even have to go through a costly crisis response phase, right? And then repairing your reputation as part of the post-crisis phase. And, and that's why, interestingly, let me just throw that in here. Uh, C4CS was founded uh, 25 years ago, uh, roughly. In the beginning, uh, back then, based in Charlotte, North Carolina, we used to do primarily crisis response work. We were called in to do firefighting, help us with something, make it go away yesterday, basically. And that was 80 some percent of our work, but only in the teens percentage-wise was really dedicated toward the pre-crisis phase and putting in place what was needed to anticipate, prevent, and, and prepare as best as possible. That has flip-flop, Richard. We still do a ton of response work, but now companies are smart management teams that Sarbanes-Oxley happen. Now individual members of boards of directors of publicly listed companies are, are responsible. They take out insurance, actually, reputation insurance and so forth. Uh, for companies. It, now we are being pulled in very early as, as far as that process is concerned. And, and we help them, we guide them through this process of proper anticipation, prevention, and obviously the preparedness. So again, we can increase crisis readiness to the point where everyone knows exactly what it is that they need to do should something happen. Well, excellent. Uh, fantastic and great advice. Uh, thanks, Oliver. Now, uh, do your crisis communications tactics change uh, depending on the type of media you're addressing? So I, I, I don't want to answer with a blanket statement here. I, I'd rather say what I mentioned earlier. It's really about very carefully analyzing the situation at hand. Um, I, I could say, as a general rule, we always have to customize, right? So yes, the particular, not only type of media, I would say the particular individual outlet we want to have a strategy that is just tailored to what do we need to accomplish what do we want to accomplish and how do we get there that's what we will do all that goes into our thinking again monitoring is key right so I, unless i have that set up so i understand what's even out there in terms of social media but certainly also traditional media and then we craft what is an individual strategy down to this particular outlet or this particular post on whatever social media channel is now a thorn in our side or can be used in favor of what it is that we're trying to promote as far as messaging is concerned, right? So we're looking for allies, including online influencers that we can pull into our tactics, the, the overall strategy and um, make it possible for our messaging to be ampl amplified, right? So RSS plays a role here and, and other techniques and, and uh, technology-based um, options that we certainly tap into at, at that point, for sure. Yeah. Customization, right, right. that's what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Exactly. And it's amazing how uh, you know, these little details can have such an impact on you know, how a crisis plays out. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Tremendous. Yeah. All right, so uh, let me ask you this. Have you ever witnessed a PR disaster, a crisis that, that was just too far gone to save? And if so, what could they have done differently to manage uh, that crisis more effectively? Oh, I have. And, and while I can't give you any specifics or, or those uh, that are part of the audience, any specifics due to NDAs and so forth, generally speaking, the, the more likely uh, uh, it, it is that we get... Uh, the message too late, as in we get that call and come in, help us, um, that, that increases the likelihood that we will, at the end of the day, not be able to, to help. The, the ideal situation, Richard, is we get word that a company needs assistance years before, potentially, and that has happened, years before something actually happens, because that gives us time to put in place all of these different strategies, tactics, the plans, the training, recurring training, right, with the crisis management team, others that need to be involved. So we're then able to respond in the very way that we should, with all the things that I uh, mentioned earlier. Now, that is, is sometimes still not the case, right? So, uh, and, and the question is, is then, 
are we uh, going to deny first or delay first <laughs> that I get from senior management? And the answer obviously is uh, we're not going to do either of those. We're going to be uh, we're going to be straightforward with this to the degree that we can. Sometimes we might hold back information uh, for a specific period of time or due to legal reasons, whatnot. We've also found that attorneys are much more open to working with us collaboratively over the years, right? So because they understand that social media, that reputation management have significantly increased of, of importance, and now we, we do need to do a better job there. Um, let, let me just say that there have been a ton of examples where companies have contacted us too late, whether that was related with uh, uh, to uh, natural disasters or a man-made disaster, industrial accident, you name it. And, and pretty much the, 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 the thing that happens, whatever scenario you might look at, is that there is a lack of proper pre preparedness. Lack of proper preparedness, that there is denial and ignorance in the boardroom coupled with that, and that there is the inability to understand that we now need to move forward quickly. I mentioned it earlier, you need to be truthful, you need to be timely. The empathy component needs to be in place in order to then churn out facts, feelings, and actions. Those are the three things, and we have a graphic at C4CS that we need to address with the messaging. And if we don't do that, then uh, we're looking at so-called PR disasters, whether that's a, I don't know, a BP, uh, Deepwater Horizon, uh, where a CEO might say something that leads to the firing of that particular individual. I mean, it's, it's, it's so many things that come to mind scenarios. We have a, a ton every year that, that have to be added to the list, unfortunately. Um, we've been involved in a good number of those, um, mostly uh, positive outcomes, but certainly there have also been ones where, again, we were simply called in too late. And that's very unfortunate. Uh, the companies have become wiser even those that um, have made big mistakes, unfortunately, they now turn to the appropriate help early enough to, to prevent uh, recurrences or prevent disaster from happening again, as far as the communications piece is concerned, right? I mean, if you have a natural disaster, there's only so much you can do if your headquarters building gets wiped out by a hurricane, well, uh, but still, you can certainly prepare for that, right? Uh, internal comms, external comms, safety, uh, the whole crisis management uh, arena in terms of strategies and tactics should be at your disposal and you should definitely pay attention to it very early on in the process. That's wonderful, Oliver. Terrific information there, appreciate that. Now, what's something that uh, you're really excited about now, whether it's personal or professional? Uh, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm gonna deviate a little bit from telling everyone about uh, client work for corporations and all that. We, I'm, I'm really excited about something that we've done for uh, more than a year now, we've, we've spread the word regarding the opioid crisis and related crisis management strategies, tactics, tools, solutions to that. And um, we, we were able to, uh, on behalf of uh, a, a client that we've been working with, Dr. Bernard Costello, who's at the University of Pittsburgh to recruit the Biden administration's drugs are uh, for uh, an event. There's also a congresswoman um, that will be speaking here uh, later uh, this month in December. I would definitely encourage, and I know this, this doesn't get aired until January, but I would encourage those interested to take a look at turning the tide on the opioid epidemic. It's, uh, it's something that I'm interested in where I have uh, found a lot of satisfaction, not only I myself, but also our staff. Um, let's face it, the, the pandemic has really, unfortunately, resulted in much less attention being paid to the opioid crisis. And oftentimes this is linked, right? So people might start taking opioids as a result of, for instance, long COVID symptoms. But the number of uh, death that we've had in this country as a result of the opioid crisis is just uh, horrifying. And I, I, I hope that we can, with, with those efforts, um, putting panels together and having uh, uh, experts, high caliber experts speak on that, that we can get the word out and, and, and really have legislators team up with um, the healthcare community uh, and, and academia and, and, and really have a concerted effort in place to 
um, as, as we say in the title that we're using to, to stem the tide, to turn the tide, that, that would be terrific. And I'm, I'm really excited about this. There's, there's good stuff going on. I also have posted to my LinkedIn profile repeatedly on that if, if folks want to check out what I have there. Uh, and send us an email. Tell us if you want to be part of this, this effort. I, I would love to hear from you. And again, this is completely outside of the uh, corporate work, which is, is really what we're doing mostly here at C4CS, but uh, very dear to me. That's kind of what sums it up. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, right. Sure. Thanks, Oliver. That, that's a great initiative and such an important message. Uh, great work you're doing on that. Okay. Now, finally, how can people connect with you? Um, so uh, uh, schmidt at c4cs.com is my email address. Uh, that's something that, um, and I hope you can uh, maybe also put that up online for, for folks to see when you uh, market the interview or, or uh, in terms of getting the word out regarding the interview. Um, there's c4cs.com. That's uh, our company website. We have uh, headquarters in Pittsburgh. We still have an office in Charlotte, North Carolina. We have associates in New York City, in uh, Florida, and uh, in, uh, in the Washington DC area. Uh, we also have representation in, uh, in Europe. Uh, we'd love to hear from folks. Uh, we also are uh, on Twitter at c4cs.info. And uh, to reach me, probably the easiest via email, and then uh, look me up on LinkedIn. It's Oliver S. Schmidt, my LinkedIn profile. Those, those are good ways to uh, uh, reach out to me. And I would love to hear from folks. Uh, whatever we might be able to assist with, we uh, will certainly attempt to do so. All right. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, lots of great information uh, that you've shared there. And that's all the time we have, everybody. So uh, again, we've been chatting with Oliver Schmidt. He's the president and CEO of C4CS. So thanks again, Oliver, for joining us today. A real pleasure. My pleasure, Richard. Al always nice to talk to you. And I had a great time doing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, event earlier this year with, with you all. And I, I look forward to staying in touch and, and uh, contributing again, if I may. Thank you. Oh, you bet. Appreciate it. Well, always great to have you. Okay, we hope you enjoyed this episode of PR Profiles brought to you by Agility. And in case you didn't hear the big news, we're bringing you double the PR Profiles episodes this year. Going forward, there will be two episodes each month. And we're excited to bring you the knowledge and insights of even more PR powerhouses in 2023. Our next episode is coming out on January 19th. So make sure to subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform or on the Agility PR Solutions YouTube channel. So thanks again to Oliver Schmidt. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you on the next episode.